Well, good morning. I'm going to say Lakeville Baptist Church because I do that every Sunday. But I'd like to say, welcome, Roseboro family. You sure know how to fill up the house. Wow. Uh, welcome, everybody. Great to see you this morning. And uh, it will be a great celebration of life. And I just want to do, before we get started, a couple quick announcements or a very short one from Barb reminding me that the Roseboro family would like to thank you all who for braving the snow that we had to, this morning and hope that you'll stay for lunch and a warm drink provided by Joanne Anderson, a Anderson and her team. They also want to thank the numerous doctors that cared for dad, but especially Dr. Morelli and the wonderful staff at Hospice Peterborough and the wonderful caring folks at Hendron's Funeral Home. And a welcome to everyone, family, that's out there on Zoom this morning as well. Great to see you. And my second welcome this morning, on behalf of the family of the Roseboros, I wish to thank each of you for being here today. This is not an easy day for any of us, particularly a family that is so close, who cherished this gentle giant that I got to know as Gordon Roseboro. Despite the difficulty of today, we have some amazing promises, and I say promises as they are not maybes. They're found in scriptures, so cling to them, embrace them, comfort them, let them comfort you and empower you today. And before we pray and hold on to God's word, as we sense the power of his presence here this morning, I want you to know that sermon illustrations come at the oddest of times and places. And when preparing this message, as to me, it's a high calling to have the words to share in a celebration of life, the right words. I always pray, what will be the highlight verse? So Barb yesterday said to me, you know that verse? For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. So there's a glass story here, and I won't be very long. I'll leave that in the message for later on. But how perfect for me trying to connect myself with my new friend, Gord Rosebro, and I say a new friend because I'm going to see him again. You see, Gordon and I connected by glass and police work in our early conversations, as I used to be in policing for those that don't. No, that sounds a little odd, glass and police work, doesn't it? But Gord worked many years at Pittsburgh Glass. And as a former police officer, I joked with him as to how much we loved our 3 a.m. phone calls to the office as the yahoos in downtown Peterborough smashed out another window or broke into an office where the door or windows needed repair. We would stand guard there until the glass men arrived. And of course, I can't rem cannot remember Gord specifically on these many calls, but I'm sure we were out there together at some point thinking, I wish we were home in our warm beds. I was thinking about that in the, the three o'clock uh, snowstorm that we had this morning. So looking through a glass darkly meant a few extra things to Gord and I. We laughed over those late night calls and Gord reminded me he didn't get overtime for those calls either. The joy today is this, is the glass may have been dark in the physical realm. It may be dark when we try to visualize our dear Lord Jesus. But today, Gord Roseboro is not cutting glass and cleaning it up so others could see a little clearer. He has a full view, face to face with a savior. And that excites me beyond belief. So when you're feeling a little sad today, over the next little while, when you're thinking of Gord, think of him on the other side of the glass in perfect peace, fully alive. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather as family and friends today to remember the precious life of Gord Roseboro. We also gather to say goodbye one last time and celebrate the life that he enjoyed here on earth, and thank you for each precious moment and memory that we've had with him. His life has touched so many in so many different ways. 
We pray that your peace and presence will be upon us during this time. And we pray this in the precious name of your Savior, Jesus Christ. And a great piece of scripture for us this morning to start is, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Psalm 46, 1 to 3. And the Bible also says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all these things, we overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This morning, we have a family member reading the 23rd Psalm for us. It's read by great-grandson Ben Roseborough. Welcome, Ben. Good morning, everyone. Oh, it's on. All right. Um, so I'm Ben. I'm the oldest out of uh, Gordon Rosebro's great grandchildren. And uh, this is my sister, Belle. She's here. If I pass out, she's going to catch me. So I'm going to be reading the uh, Psalm 23 today. The Lord, oh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will not fear no evil for thou art with me the rod and thy staff they comfort me thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies thou anointest my head with oil my cup run, runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For those of you who don't know, I'm... Uh... Mum and dad's daughter-in-law, Barb, I'm married to Jim, and the best in-laws a person could ever have. Um, Mum has chosen some of dad's favorite hymns for the service, and I'm wondering if you could stand and join me. Blessed Assurance. <laughs>
What incredible singing this morning. Wonderful church, thank you. We have some tributes this morning from family members, which is always so important and so vital this morning. And the first one up this morning is Sarah. Sarah, come on up. I guess it's Sarah. But yeah, both words. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that all of you have joined us today to remember my wonderful grandpa. <laughs> all right. Here we go. All right, it's gonna get real. My bampa lived 92 years. And somehow when someone is loved so deeply, it is not long enough. I could go on with a lifetime of memories, but I'll just give you a little snapshot. As many of you know, hockey is a pretty big deal in our family. Many Christmases were spent at Bampa and Grandma's enjoying family time. We would eat Grandma's amazing cooking and we would watch the hockey game. Growing up, everyone around me was playing hockey and I loved it. But meanwhile, I could barely skate. I just never got the hang of it. Even now, my son Isaac is trying to teach me how to come to a stop safely. <laughs> but each year, Grandpa would find me on the ice and he would take my hand and he would say, let's go for a lap or two, Sari. Now he was a giant of a man and I was a little girl. So his idea of like the pace of this skate was a little different <laughs> than mine, but I trusted him completely. He always kept me upright. I never fell, not even once. He was the kind of man that would never let you down. Growing up, I might not have played hockey like everybody else in my family, but I did play a lot of other sports. I liked volleyball and basketball the most. And I remember a basketball game that I was at at PCVS and grandpa came over after the game and he said, so did you win? And later on, he added something about not knowing all the rules of the game. And I realized it didn't really matter to him if I won or lost. He just wanted to come and support me in what I loved. Another memorable example of this was when I asked him to grow blue pumpkins for me. And I knew it was a big ask. Those vines just take over and they take over everything. Every inch of land you give them. And he knew it too. And he barely hesitated when I asked the first time. The second year I asked, he was a little less enthusiastic, but he still allowed it. And along with the blue pumpkins, I had saved seeds from a huge pumpkin that I had bought from the Leahy's. And I thought, oh, it would be so great to grow one of our own. I had these huge dreams of successfully growing one. And on the day Bompa called to say they're ready, I enlisted my siblings to all come out and help, load them up in the van. And that was the last time that I asked Grandpa to plant pumpkins for me, as that task had just invaded the beautiful garden that he had. But I also know he didn't really mind. He felt that the sacrifice was worth the joy. I'll always be grateful to him for allowing it to happen, knowing that it would invade his beautiful garden. Bampa, my dad, and my husband Jay, and pretty much everyone in my whole family had this unspoken understanding that Sari has big dreams and we're the good men who are gonna make them happen. And since I was little, I always dreamt of having a Christmas home, one that would have a front porch and enough room to host my family and friends. And this home, it came to us five years ago and needed many renovations, countless. And during one of these many renos, Bampa just happened to drive by and he saw Jay and I struggling to remove these huge old windows from the back addition. And his training from years with Peterborough Glass kicked in and he effortlessly showed us an efficient way to carry those huge things. He was always there to lend a hand and seemed to show us what to do 
at just the right time. Whenever I visited Grandma and Bampa, they would both sit with me, asking how each member of our family was doing, mentioning any news about our cousins out west, and sweet Vera. They spoke with pride about all of us, like we could do no wrong. Unconditional love, this is what I'll remember about my time with them. Always seeing the best in us and supporting our dreams and our choices, regardless of whether or not they agreed. You would never ever hear a negative word. Maybe they would have done things differently, but that was the extent of the criticism. And it was always followed with something like, well, everyone has their own choices to make and they'll come out okay. So many things Bampa did meant the world to me. For my wedding day, Bampa grew his most beautiful gladiola for the arrangements at the front of the church. And ever since then, he would plant purple glads and gift them to me in August for our anniversary. He knew that I loved the color purple. And he came to my house one day while I was out at work and planted several grape hyacinths in my front garden. And they come up every spring and they remind me of his thoughtfulness. I'm so grateful for all these reminders of his huge heart. His garden was second to none with all of us benefiting from his harvest. Family, friends, neighbors in the Lakefield Food Bank, everyone shared in the reward of his labor. Bampa knew I love beets and he'd always remind me that he had some, but I might have to fight Elaine Fisher for them. <laughs> Thanks for sharing them with me, Elaine. In 2020, even though COVID kept our family apart much of the time, Bampa won the Grandparent of the Year Award. I remember the day the camera crew came to their house to interview him, and he was uncomfortable in the spotlight, a spotlight like so many of our Roseboro men, but I can't think of anyone more deserving of this title. He and grandma were the best grandparents we could have ever asked for. It wouldn't be right to conclude without highlighting the lighter side of Bampa. Bampa was a faithful churchgoer, sitting right where Josh is. However, he was not always a fan of the length of church-related things. Grandma doesn't believe me, but with Cheryl Peck as my witness, I remember Bampa letting out subtle sighs when the sermon or the long-winded prayers would go on for too long. He was a man of deep faith, but he had things he needed to do. Throughout our lives, there were numerous family gatherings, and at each one, the Crokinol board was brought out, and each generation would challenge, challenge Bampa to a match. We all preferred to be Bampa's partner because naturally that would be the winning side. But if that spot was already taken, there was always that desire to try to beat him. He was patient with us. Even though my hands would literally shake under the pressure, he would smirk and chuckle away when we missed an obviously easy shot. Even in this high stakes competition, he was still willing to share the tips and tricks that would help us blast the opposing player's piece right off the board, sometimes even at his own expense. His shots were always tried and true. I never saw him miss. He was just that good. It's hard to describe such an incredible man. Genuine, kind, hardworking, loyal, and loving. He cared deeply for grandma's well-being. And even in the last days, always asked me to check in on her whenever I visited him. Their love is inspiring. It is real and lifelong and had a measurable impact on all of us. How lucky he was to be loved so deeply by grandma for over 70 years. As we celebrate Bampa's life today, we acknowledge that his earthly loss is heartbreaking. But today I also see him enjoying what he has looked forward to in faith his whole life. Bampa often walked the fields with Amy and I up to the Roseboro farm where he grew up. I always loved sharing this part of him, his history. And when he was at hospice, he would often wake up and tell us that he had been dreaming of the farm, walking the cows along the back fence line, just as he would have as a boy. We know that the animals and gardens of heaven are well taken care of. He is gone from our sight, but lives on in our hearts. 
and our gardens, and in all the ways that he passed knowledge, understanding, and love to us. I love you, Pampa. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was beautiful. Now I'm a little nervous about the length of my sermon. <laughs> uh, next, our granddaughter-in-law. That's the best uh, interpretation I have here. Leanne. Leanne, welcome. Wow. All right. So insert grandpa's sigh now, because I'm a talker and this is long. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Hello, and thank you all for coming. I know I'm just the granddaughter-in-law, but I have to say that I have been incredibly blessed <laughs> to call you my grandpa and so very proud to be a Roseboro. It's fine. Gordon, also known as Dick, Kenneth Roseboro. Where does one even start? I could stand here for a lengthy part of our day and reminisce about the many stories that Grandpa was either part of or had shared with us throughout the years. Apart from family, you've had the opportunity to pass. Sorry, one sec. Apart from family, if you have had the opportunity to pass by Gordon, meet him at the rink, see him in the pew bench at Lakefield Baptist Church, Swish LA enjoying quarter chicken white, maybe window shopping at a few of his favorite places such as Sears, Canadian Tire, and who knew one of my personal favorites, Home Sense. Shopping along with his sidekick, wife, and bestest friend, Doris. Then you, my friend, have been impacted and blessed. I personally have had the privilege and blessing to know this incredible grandpa for 24 years and what a precious gift it has been. The past few weeks have been a mix of emotions, bittersweet, heartbreaking, but yet heartwarming all in the same time. Regular visits to hospice the last seven weeks have given us all the opportunity to share some precious moments, ask many questions, reminiscent, reminisce the past, and share tears, and even more some chuckles along the way. Every moment had been so valuable as we knew they were going to soon come to an end. One day while driving into Peterborough, Brian and I talked about our visits and how they've been difficult, but yet such a blessing. Brian commented about feeling grateful as he's been able to have the time to ask grandpa every question he could think of and shortly follow with. I'm sure there will be many more that will cross my mind once he's gone, but I am content that we've had the time to ask him everything we've wanted to. Something that's crossed my mind a few times this past few weeks is how many can say that they've lived to be 92, just short of 70 years married to their best friend, have had three successful children, 11 grandchildren, and 22 great grandchildren. It's an impressive accomplishment. If you knew Gordon, you know that his greatest joy and biggest priority was his family. He took great pride in his family and the Roseboro family name, but yet was always a very humble man. Sometimes I think we have taken it for granted as to how amazing we have it in this family. He was the epitome of how great and unselfish it is to put those in your family first. Grandpa along with grandma always put everyone around them first, whether it be at church, friends, neighbors, and their family. It really meant to the world to him. I want to thank you for loving me from one day one. From the moment I met you both, you accepted me for who I was and with open arms. You've cared for each of us, invested heart, time, and love. If you knew Grant, if you knew him, you'd know many of his passions, his immense love for gardening, flowers, my favorite, his gigantic sunflowers, his horses, the family farm, hockey, dad's cookies, peanut butter, turtles, watching baseball, which included the Jays gaming, always commenting on the lady in the front row in the stands, which were always eating the snacks. <laughs> Lacrosse, football, friends, family, but more important, his love for his beautiful wife, Doris, whom he met at a football game in Peterborough under the bleachers. <laughs> We loved hearing him share his story as to how we met grandma. He would say, yep, she married me for my money and then chuckle knowing that that really wasn't the reason. As 
recently. He was telling us about how he went into Peterborough to watch a football game with the young people's group that he had been a part of, and many needed a ride into town. As you can see him thinking about it, he said, yep, they needed a ride, and I don't know how I ended up with all the girls. A short pause with his smile and then said, and they were all mine, <laughs> as he chuckled. But the most important one, Grandma, who had his heart from the beginning. I've always had an incredible amount of respect for both Grandma and Grandpa and wondered what the secret was to 69 years. I had asked Grandpa a few years ago as to what the secret was, and he responded with, well, I don't really know, but whatever it was, it's working as she's still here. <laughs> I look at them with perfection and I had often wondered, do you ever have their, do they ever have their moments? After wondering for some time if they have had an occasional bicker moment, I have to chuckle because one day I witnessed one. It was during our COVID season. I had called grandma to see how she was doing and if there was anything they had needed. While talking to grandma on the phone, I could hear grandpa in the background saying, mom, mom, who is it? Mom, is that Jim? Tell him I'm at a wheat germ. I'm at a wheat germ, mom. Grandma, in her soft and very patient voice, said to me, he doesn't need wheat germ. <laughs> and just one second, you could hear in the background explain to Grandpa that it wasn't Jim, but Leanne. Then I could hear Grandpa out of frustration respond, well, you could have said so, but you just kept wah, 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 wah. I laughed while waiting for grandma to return to the phone, thinking how refreshing it was to know that they too have their little moments. <laughs> what a beautiful story, love story, to be married to your best friend for almost seven years and to share such a bond right up to his last breath. As much as my heart broke several evenings watching grandpa grip grandpa's, grandma's hands for calling out for her, made my heart ache, but it also gave me joy and made me smile it was, as it was incredibly heartwarming to watch how great their love was for each other and what living up to until death do us part really meant. Thank you both for being an incredible example of what true love is all about. Marriages work some at times, but only works if we do it together with love and grace. Thank you for your demonstration of what love means and being one of the most influential couples in our lives. All because two people fell in love, the Roseboros have grown a very large, healthy family tree with so much strength and love that is grounded at the roots and extended to the tips of each family branch. Grandpa, who will ever forget that smile? I think his smile instantly connected those who came in contact with him, and it was contagious. I also think many in this room would echo that Grandpa was one of the most amazing human beings there is to have gotten to know. His kind smile, his big heart, his love for others, and most of all, again, for his family also known as the friendly giant. His smile will always remain imprinted in our hearts. Who can forget his generosity, his work ethic, humility, and selflessness are all the qualities I have also admired of him. Another trait that stands out is his determination. Some may call it stubborn. Some may say perseverance. Some could say strong-willed, but the best description would be determined. I have never witnessed one to be so determined not to give up and are willing to say goodbye just yet. Last summer, we were telling the kids that we will need to visit more often and make the best of our visits, as there are not going to be many more. A year later, here, here we were, still saying the same thing. Just short of seven weeks ago, we really thought it was nearing the end within a week or two. Who would have thought that he'd be with us first of and more? After six weeks passed, the doctor had told the family 24 to 48 hours. Nope, not according to Grandpa. <laughs> Then the Norsets had said that evening, which was Sunday evening, he wouldn't make it into the morning. And nope, he held on for another 24 hours. As we were surrounded, as he was surrounded by many family members that evening he passed, we had summed it up so that he didn't want to go or miss out on anything. He was enjoying listening and being around his, his greatest blessings. Who can forget his humor? Anyone who knew Grandpa was entertained by his great humor. He always had a subtle with witty comeback or comment to make for the, almost every conversation. You never knew what little funny comment or pun he had waiting for the conversation, but you knew there would be one coming following by that smile, laugh, or little chuckle. I'm sure you all have your own memories of this, but I'll share just a few. Sorry, it's long. <sighs> Hospice. In the last few days while being attended to by nurses, Grandpa had been waiting for his meds. He muttered that he 
they weren't fast enough. And when we said that they were on their way, and it was just a few short minutes, he commented that it had been hours. When the nurse arrived, she placed her hand on his back, asking him how he was doing. And he looked over to grandma. Does she even know what she's doing? We chuckled and thankfully we could just use morphine as the excuse. Hockey. Grandpa made it out to many of the kids' hockey games. One evening in Ennismore, Brian was coaching and on the bench, he made a comment in a heated moment. We watched from the stands as the ref and him were having a conversation and after the ref kicking Brian out of the game, Grandpa had no problem sharing his thought. Oh, Brian, should have been listening and focusing on the game rather than yipping. After this past week, I haven't been able to shake a song out of my head after hearing a story from Aunt Sue about Grandpa shaving and singing at the top of his lungs, Rod Stewart, if you want my body, if you think I'm saving the rest of that portion for your own imagination. Grandpa's shaving song, who knew? Who can forget Daryl and Jenny's wedding when Grandpa traveled to Thunder Bay with us, but without Grandma to make sure he was looked after? I think he enjoyed his moments of freedom as he just so happened to forget his tie. Grandma didn't know until she was able to see the pictures from the celebration. Grandpa definitely enjoyed not wearing a tie that day. And Grandpa's hugs. Those that know me do know that I'm Italian, and with that comes lots of hugging. I do realize not every culture shares the same love for hugs, but Grandpa did. When I first met Grandpa Roseboro, he gave me one of the biggest hugs. This may have been settling knowing that some of the Roseboros passed the hug test, as Grandpa really did give the biggest and the best hugs. They were always welcoming, warming, comforting, and I truly will miss those. Grandpa genuinely was one of the greatest listeners. He always invested in each of his family members' lives by asking questions, checking in on the latest updates as to what was going on in our lives, and or knowing just what to say. He encouraged us to do what was right, to work hard, and to do our best. I think just by leading by example, he exemplified how to be genuine and a kind human being. Even his weeks at hospice, when he was in pain, he invested in the nurses by asking him, them how they were doing, having conversations with them and listening to them share sometimes even holding their hands and always thanking them for being present and assisting him to when it was needed. When one passes at such an age as 92, a common response would be that they lived a good and fulfilled life. Yes, it may be true, but with that makes it even harder as it comes with more memories, time together, lifelong stories and many extra moments that make the heart hurt immensely once gone. It's bittersweet and really such a clash of many emotions. We're heartbroken for those who loved him and so gratefully blessed to have had them in our, him in our lives. It makes the goodbyes that much harder. Lastly, the goodbyes. Not too sure what your departure from family gatherings visits looks like, but I had never experienced the one like the Roseboros. Generally, fashionably late to the event and the last ones to leave. After 24 years being a part of this family, I've learned to say goodbye an hour before we have to leave. You start off in the common room, giving hugs, chatting for a few minutes and saying you're leaving. Then you make your way out to the hallway in their mudworm and repeat the same. Then a few steps more as you head out the door, sometimes you'd give your third round of hugs and continue with your goodbye. And lastly, making your way into the vehicle while rolling the window down and talking about the week ahead or asking a question that requires to stay a little longer. I'm not complaining by any means as I've truly loved and valued these moments. There's something, there is something to be said about our departures when it's not always easy to just get up and go. The most common remark that's pulled on my heart strings all week is, and I can hear his voice clearly saying, well, we'll see you then. I was trying to think of a time that I actually heard grandpa say goodbye or see you later. I often found that whenever we departed, he put his arm around us each of us giving us a big hug and would say, oh, we'll see you then. Yes, Grandpa, we'll see you then. Grandpa being a man of faith and having love for our Heavenly Father, we know that he is now in heaven and one day we will be reunited, reunited, ready to see that smile, receive his hugs again. Grandpa, thank you for being our biggest fan, supporter, example, and the biggest impact in our lives. We will truly miss you, but we have so many wonderful memories to hang on to. You are an incredible role model and a friend the best grandfather and great grandfather anyone could ask for. I pray that our kids will always re be reminded of your qualities. I continue to grow with these traits. I know that your love will carry through us moving forward in, in your words. Well, we'll see you then. We'll see you then, Grandpa. Love you always.
Yeah, and that was beautiful. Thank you. And our third is granddaughter Amy. Bless you, Amy. I struggled so much to write this tribute. I must have started writing it a hundred times. I kept being bogged down by the tremendous weight of needing to convey just how much Bampa is loved and how much his life is cherished and the depth of the loss felt in the wake of his passing. It felt impossible, but somewhere in my fumbling, I suddenly realized I didn't need to convey any of that perfectly. I didn't need to convey it because everyone here today already knows how wonderful Bampa was. I'm now free to simply share some of my favorite memories with people who love and appreciate Bampa as much as I do. And that feels like a much easier task. When I look back on my childhood, one of my favorite things to do with Bampa was to simply follow him around the land he loved with my big sister, Sarah. Our journey would always begin in the kitchen with grandma, making sure we were properly provisioned with pockets full of peanuts. Our stomachs well provided for, we would head outside past the climbing tree and the stunning flowers lining the driveway and through the gap in the hedge to Bampa's garden. He would check on his vegetables, a fair portion of which would be quietly donated to the Lakefield Food Bank. And if we were lucky, we might get to sample peas or beans or raspberries if they were in season. Sometimes we would stop to check on the playhouse Bampa built for Aunt Sue, complete with custom windows that he cut and fitted himself. Another favorite stop on our journey was the chicken barn to visit the baby chicks. Bampa grew up a true farm boy, and I'm sure there wasn't much room for sentimentality when it came to farm animals, but he cradled the fluffy little yellow chick so gently in his big strong hands. It was the same gentle spirit on display when he would hold Sarah and I on his lap in his big blue chair, one on each knee, and read to us. No matter what we were doing, Bampa was always fully present with us. It felt like there was nowhere else on earth he would rather be than sharing his life with us. That gift of presence would continue throughout our lives. Barring illness or injury, he and grandma were at every performance, celebration, and gathering, quietly cheering us on. Family was so, so important to Bampa. From the chicken barn, we would head to the woods. It was still and quiet, with pine needles like carpet on the ground. It was just a little creepy, with its skeletal pine trees and occasional animal noises, but we were never afraid. We would have followed Bampa anywhere. Eventually, we would come upon the old abandoned car surrounded by trees, and Sarah and I would spend a good portion of the moments that followed, trying to puzzle out just how it could have possibly ended up there. I don't think Bampa ever told us its origin story, but he definitely got a kick out of listening to our theories. After a time, we would break through the trees into the wide open fields. Bampa would tease us about stepping in cow patties, and he would always use his big walking stick to hold open the electric fences for us to crawl through. It was with Bampa that I first looked into the gentle and wise blue eyes of a cow framed with gorgeous long lashes. I never got to ride one, but somewhere there's a photo of Josh being held in place atop a heifer by Bampa's strong arms. I'm so grateful for the gift he gave us when he shared his love of the natural world with us. As we walked, Bampa would point out landmarks and share bits and pieces of memories with us. The land held decades worth of stories and we followed Bampa's memories like breadcrumbs leading us back to the Roseboro farmhouse, the place where the tale of his life began. We would always wind up at Uncle Bruce's farm, and if he was around, Bampa would chat with him while we greeted Bear the dog. 
Bampa would always take pity on me and lead me into the barn so I could continue my unrequited love affair with the barn cats. I remember one afternoon so clearly. We were on our way home through the fields and the sky was so blue with perfect cotton candy clouds floating by. Bampa lied down in the grass on a hill and invited us to join him. We stayed there for ages, pointing out shapes in the clouds. I don't think I've ever had such a carefree experience. I could live in that memory forever. The time would inevitably come for us to make the journey down the hill, back to the home Bampa built with his own two hands on a parcel of family land. It always felt to me as if we had traveled through space and time during our walks with Bampa. In reality, we had only traveled a short distance, orbiting Bampa's North Star, his true love, his best friend, Grandma. To her, we always returned with nary a peanut left in our pockets, but we were full of stories and love and happy memories that I continue to carry in my heart, always. Thank you, Bampa. I love you. Thank you, Amy. Wonderful, wonderful memories. Now, Gord's son, Jim Roseborough, is going to speak. Thank you, Jim. My goodness, I, I, I can remember years ago when we used to have the family Christmas up at the family farm and we all actually fit in the house and I look out now and just our family won't fit in that in that house and it's, it's amazing and thank you all for coming. Um, Sue, Dave and I would like to thank you for braving the weather and coming out to this celebration of, of dad's life and we put together a few of our memories of dad and um, I'll start with Dave's. Dad had a great love for his horses. While Dad was home on the farm, the horses were used often. He said they were very smart and soon learned what was expected of them while working in the field, especially when they were plowing. I think Dad appreciated their intelligence, especially after staying out too late the night before. He could tell the horses what he wanted them to do, and then they would carry on, and he could then close his eyes for a snooze. Of course, he still had to do his part to keep alert enough not to fall off the seat. Since the horses seemed to be so gentle and reliable, I once asked him if they were broke for riding. He said, no, they were never ridden, except once. Dad and Uncle Stu were getting the horses out of the stall and readying them for the day, a day of work. While still in the barn, they thought they should try to ride one. Uncle Stu went first, and if he had been outside, it may have been a ride worthy of the Calgary Stampede. Still in the barn, not so much. The horse immediately started to buck. Uncle Stu went up in the air, hit the ceiling, hit the horse, hit the ceiling, hit the horse, then the wall, and finally the floor where he was almost trampled. Dad didn't try it. He also told a story of how daredevilish he was as a kid. I'm not sure if he or one of his siblings was the initiator of this escapade. He and I presume Uncle Stu. There's a thing there with Uncle Stu and Dad. A lot of people thought they were twins, but there was two years apart um, um, between them. Uncle Stu, but sounded like others as well, would climb the tall tree beside their farmhouse and from there jump over to the roof. Up two and a half stories, they would run around on the roof. When Grandpa Rosebro caught them, he would yell at them to get down. They did, but as soon as he went inside, they'd climb the tree and do it all over again. Dad was still amazed that somebody didn't fall off the roof and kill themselves. He was also generous and sharing, most notice noticeably giving away fruit and vegetables from his garden whether walking up the side road to give neighbors quarts of raspberries, driving potatoes into the food bank, or offering all kinds of things to the kids and grandkids. One incident which stood out above all these today for 45 years, he was about to head back to university after being home for the weekend when dad came over and put a $20 bill in his hand. He can't remember what he said or if he said anything, but what he did has stuck with Dave all these years. It didn't sound like much, it doesn't sound like much now, 
but back then I know it was a lot for mom and dad to give to help me out and it has always been a special thought of dad's generosity. I will forever be thankful to dad and mom for their consistency in making sure we attended Sunday school church and youth group when we were at home. Now after experiencing raising our kids and seeing them now raising their own kids, I know how tough it is to keep that up week after week, year after year, but dad and mom made it happen. I have the certificate of dedication filled out by Reverend Eichenauer in 1964 that says, I was brought to the house of the Lord by the parents Doris and Gordon Roseboro and was there publicly dedicated to God. Mom and dad took that seriously and I had 14 years of perfect attendance in Sunday school. Even when I went off to university, mom and dad would call nearly every Sunday afternoon and dad's first question would always be, did you go to church this morning? Rarely would my answer not be yes as the good habit instilled while I was growing up kept me on course until it really became my own priority. Another influence in my life was dad's hard work attitude. I always noticed it. And he didn't just teach hard work, he taught to do it well and take pride in what you're doing. Whether it was installing glass in a customer's wood sash with perfectly smooth and even putty, or having grass neatly cut even when nobody else would see it, or having rows of vegetables in a garden planted in a row as straight as a die, or wielding a caulking gun like you were Rembrandt painting a masterpiece. When we were at home, he would put in a full day's work at his job. After that, he would rush home and take Jim and me to hockey, and later he came to many of his grandkids and great-grandkids games, often after putting in a day of work at home. Two years ago, when Dad's health started to go downhill, I would tell my friends at church about his decline, but I would tell them that up until then, even at 90 years old, he would be able to work any one of us into the ground. He cut his own grass, shoveled the snow, worked a big garden, and often made time to go and help someone else with painting or building or a myriad of other things. In fact, his doctor at hospice commented a number of times about dad that they can recognize the patients who have been hardworking and independent all their lives by their perseverance and will to live without complaining about their situation. That was dad. I worked for dad for a couple of years and saw his work ethic there. One day I, I was in the warehouse part of the building cleaning some stock. Doing it while standing was hard on the back, so after a while, I sat on a chair. To me, it would be just as quick getting things cleaned up, maybe even quicker as my back would not bother me as much. But Dad came by and was not impressed. Don't let me see you sitting there again. One thing about Dad, if he was upset about something, he let you know about it, and he only had to yell, or to yell, to tell you once. Any of you who know Dad at all are aware how important family was to him. Putting pictures together for the slideshow was difficult because how do you choose just a hundred? There may be thousands we have, and most of them are pictures of dad and mom surrounded by us kids, then grandkids, and then great grandkids, and all possible combinations in between. And dad loved each and every child, grandchild and great grandchild, and was always interested in what they were doing and how they were keeping. His most exuberant questions would start like, how's Joshy doing? Or what's Brenty up to? And his love for all the little ones was reciprocal. Grandkids and great grandkids were drawn to him. I don't remember any hesitation for one or more kids to jump up on his lap to read a book, share an apple, get messy with an ice cream cone, or just visit. One of the last days we visited him in hospice, he was still fairly alert, but was having a hard time speaking. But I know the first thing he said, because even though it wasn't clear, it was what he always asked first How's everybody? We are going to miss, miss, all miss dad very much. But we're all really thankful that we have had such a loving father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. And some thoughts from Sue. Dad would show how much he cared, not just in words, but in actions. And examples of this are, when each of my three pets passed away, I called Dad just sobbing. He would ask if I was okay to drive to their house and told me he would take care of everything. By the time I arrived, arrived, Dad had already dug a little grave in a spot that he thought they would enjoy, surrounded by flowers and close to Freckles, the family dog we had when we were kids. He had the material ready to build a little coffin to the size that each was needed. Dad would often come down to my place in Coburg and help either trim trees or with building projects. He would pack his van the night before with every tool he thought he might need or get to use. There was just enough room for him to drive. He had over 30 years on me and it was all I could do to keep up with him. The last time he came down, he was 89 years old. He often liked to sit on the rocker on my front porch, hidden behind a tall bush 
while finishing off his chocolate milk after lunch and watch what was going on in the neighborhood. He would also always ask how my car was running and was I taking it in for regular tune-ups. Whenever I left their house, especially at night, he would say, don't make your mom worry. Call, let it ring three times and hang up so she knows you got home, okay? Or send her a computer thing. Dad, dad was not techie at all. Yeah. If dad enjoyed our Thursday quarter chicken white outings, he wasn't much for shopping, but he didn't want to miss out. He would bring mom into Peterborough in the afternoon, and if it was a store he liked, he would join us. Otherwise, he was quite content to sit in the vehicle and people watch. He never complained about how, lo how long we were in the store, regardless of the season. He would make a comment that he was getting hungry, and that was our cue. It was time to head to Swiss Chalet. As this routine was over years, the waitresses would automatically bring him his coffee and wait for him to repeat the same order of quarter chicken white with gravy and fries. He would sometimes, though, switch it up and try the ribs. He would socialize with his favorite waitresses and kept track of what was going on in their lives, especially if they had kids that played hockey in the area. He liked that they all remembered him, even when he returned after a lengthy absence due to COVID. And now some of my reflections. Dad was proud of the work he did. He worked at Pittsburgh Glass on Sherbrooke Street in Peterborough for most of his working life. He put together windows and doors for a lot of the storefronts in Peterborough and area and the windows in the library at Trent University. He would often reminisce about doing jobs down along the lake between Coburg and Belleville, back in the days before the 401 when Highway 2 was the main east-west highway. He was always a mentor to many of the other employees and liked to call them his boys. Some of them even went on to start their own companies in Peterborough, Peterborough Glass and Window and Vision Glass. Dad was also very proficient with a caulking gun. He was helping us renovate a bathroom one day and I was taping and mudding the corner joints of the drywall, a job that I hated. He watched for a few minutes and said, why wouldn't you just run a bead of caulking down there? <laughs> and I thought to this day that his idea would likely work and take a lot less time, but food for thought. <laughs> and speaking of food, dad was sort of set in his likes and dislikes when it came to meals. Tropicana orange juice and Quaker regular instant oatmeal were breakfast favorites. Being in charge of quality at Quaker for many years, I often got asked, what are those black spots in my oatmeal? That's not mouse poop, is it? <laughs> I don't think it was, but who knows? <laughs> Lunch typically involved a peanut butter sandwich, something I inherited from him. And supper was strictly meat and potatoes, no pasta, no pizza, no Chinese food, etc. And one of dad's favorite supper items won't be found in Canada's food guide, salt. It didn't matter who'd prepared it or what it was, the salt shaker was put into use before the food had even been sampled. And we have a theory that because salt is a preservative, it helped him to live into his 90s. Dad loved hockey and was very involved as a team manager in Lakefield Minor Hockey when Dave and I were growing up. Throughout the ensuing years, he delighted in watching his grandchildren and great-grandchildren play in many arenas all over the province. He enjoyed the games, but over the years, he came up with a few sayings that he would use if he witnessed some certain frustrating events happening on the ice. And three of them were, he's got a shot that wouldn't break an egg. And they're so bunched together, you could throw a blanket over the whole team. And, and another, a favorite of mine, he couldn't take a pass if it was nailed to his stick. <laughs> Dad was also passionate, passionate about gardening. Whether flower beds or vegetable gardens, he loved to look after them all, and he received many accolades on how well they looked. He started us into gardening at a very early age, and I can remember that there were to be five kernels of corn planted in each hill, but I didn't know what five was, so he said, two and two and one more. Dad was also a plant doctor. If you had a plant that wasn't doing well, you took it to dad and he could usually nurse it back to health. He could also be stubborn about getting help when the yard work, with the yard work as he got older. To me, when you're in your late 80s or early 90s, I suppose it's okay to ask for help. He would often say that he had three lawnmowers all fixed up and ready to go, but no one ever comes over to use them. I'd call dad to tell him I'd be over tomorrow to help cut the grass and he'd often reply, it's okay, I've already done it. And bird watching was another favorite pastime of mom and dad's. They had a number of feeders in the tree in front of the living room window, and they would delight in the various birds that would come each season. 
However, they weren't so fond of the squirrels that would invite themselves to the feast. Dad developed a number of deterrents to prevent them from getting into the feeders, and he also used a live trap to catch and relocate them. And Joanne Anderson is here somewhere. She's helping with the lunch today. And uh, Dad would always joke that he took the squirrels he caught up the seventh line to her house and let them go. But he also believed that the majority of them raced back to his house and got there before he did. This church played a big part in Dad's life. He told us about coming here as a young boy with his grandmother and falling asleep in her lap. Later in life, he would serve as a deacon and a trustee and on the property committee. You wouldn't often see him at the front of the church, but rather quietly ensuring the property and building were kept in shape or bringing in some of the produce from his garden for the Thanksgiving display and donation to the food bank. As many of you know, Roseboros aren't typically huggers. Leanne. <laughs> But it seemed to be the mission of some of the ladies of the church to try and change this. Pat Pope, Ruth Brown, and Cheryl Peck were a few of them. I dare say that I believe they succeeded, and he actually looked forward to those Sunday morning welcomes. This is the hard part. Dad bravely fought cancer for the last 15 months and ended up going to hospice in Peterborough eight weeks ago. It was a very difficult decision for mom and dad since they were used to caring for each other for over 69 years. Despite his declining health, Dad still put others ahead of himself, telling the nurses to be careful not to hurt themselves when they were repositioning him or getting him in and out of bed. Despite being bedridden, he kept his sense of humor. A nurse came in to help him to go to the washroom and asked him if he had to go number one or number two. Dad said number one, and the nurse left the room to get the supplies needed. At that point, Dad turned to me and he says, I hope his definition of number one is the same as mine. <laughs> Barb and I would usually visit in the morning and mum would go in after supper. When we would visit, he would always ask if we had talked to mum today or what is mum doing today? As we left, he would often end the visit with, take care of mum. Dad, we have this. While you were in hospice, the staff and volunteers were angels caring for you. You are now with the angels in heaven. We love you and we miss you, but look forward to the day we see you again. God bless. Well, <laughs> you probably need to stretch your legs. <laughs> Let's... I don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand and sing another one of Dad's favorites. <laughs>
I'm getting a little concerned there might be some sighs and groans going on from upstairs for, <laughs> as we move on. So I'm thinking I don't know how to edit this sermon at this point. So I'm just going to give it out there. So it's such great stories this morning. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, family. It was, that was awesome. So good for me to hear those things. And as we gather this morning to remember the incredible life of Gord Roseborough, I know that many of you are dealing with mixed emotions. I was just getting to know Gord and was hearing so many wonderful stories. I learned very early when visiting that he would rather help than to be helped. In today's world, do we need more of that? I remember at hospice, hospice, I asked, Gord, can I pray for you before I go? Oh, no. And then he realized, oh, yes, please pray for me. It was because he didn't want me to do any more work. And we did laugh. And we did pray together several times, many times, actually, and shared the Lord's Supper together. What a privilege it was for me to spend time with Gord at hospice. On the one hand, there are emotions of great sadness today. Sadness not for Gord, because he is in a far better place, but sadness because we have lost a dear loved one. But on the other hand, there is great joy knowing that because of the relationship that Gord had and has with the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has already been in his presence. For the scriptures say, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would be prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home or in the body or away from it. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 8. And for the Christian, there is no greater joy than to be in the presence of the one that loves them so dearly. So today, although we mourn and feel a sense of loss, it's also a day of celebration. It's not a day of regret, but truly a day of rejoicing. Today, we come to remember the life of Gord Roseboro and reminisce over all the special moments that all of you have had with him, including me. Gord had a relationship that carried some wonderful promises found in scripture, particularly John. And let me read a little bit of that. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. So the first promise to Christians is that we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear it. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. We are troubled when we don't know what's going to happen when we die. But Jesus has taken the fear out of dying. He has conquered the grave and death. So there's no need to be in fear of our eternal home and our eternal future. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And you know what the good news is this morning? Death had no hold on Christ, nor does it have a hold on any of us. Because Christ conquered death, there should be no fear for the Christian, because through Christ, we also conquer death. We are troubled when we view death as an end instead of a beginning. So let's try to flip this thinking if you can. And I know it's hard today. But think of today as a new beginning for an awesome saint, Gord Roseboro. This is by no means an end today. It's the start of forever. And isn't that exciting? For if we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Gord's life is not over. As a matter of fact, it just began. He has shed the temporary for the eternal, the tarnished for the spotless, and the passing for the everlasting. 
Yes, our earthly bodies die. However, our heavenly bodies endure for all eternity. The second promise Jesus makes is there is a place for us. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is a place with no more sorrow or crying. Heaven is a place where the hurts and disappointments of this world have no more sting, where the frustrations of life are replaced with unspeakable joys, where the pains of life are not permitted, and the failures of life control us no longer, a place with no more pain. Heaven has no handicapped parking spaces. There are no pharmacies, no prescriptions to fill anymore. Heaven doesn't have hospitals, nursing homes, or rehabilitation centers. The days of aches and pains are over. The trips to the doctors have ceased, and all the pain has ended. The third promise in John 14, Jesus personally receives believers. Now, I want you to imagine this, this moment that Gord took his first breath in heaven, the Lord was right there to welcome him. The last breath here, the first breath in heaven, and there's Jesus right there. The first image he saw was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was there with his arms wide open to receive Gord to that great mansion that has been prepared, pre prepared for all of his children. And for Gord, experienced a love that we can't even understand. A love that forgives every failure. A love that mends the hurts only he knew. A love that understood every feeling that he had. It's unconditional love that completely satisf satisfies the longing of the soul, of his soul. And the last promise is that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Paraphrasing Jesus' words in John 14, 6, Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, you say you don't know the way to heaven, but you do know I am the way, the truth, and the life. More than anything Gord understood was this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Gord's life revolved around this promise, and because of his relationship with the Savior, he is in a place that we can't imagine and is experiencing a love that we can't even comprehend. So concluding, friends, as we work through the grief of losing Gord, we have the opportunity to consider what will become of us in life after death. Think hard about what we just read in John 3. I know Gord would want to be sure I ask you, to ask you this today. Today is a gift. Tomorrow is an uncertainty. Let's go with the gift and make sure we all remain together as a forever family with Christ at the center of all of us. Can we pray together? God of all compassion, we come to you today with questions and sorrow, but with full knowledge that Gord Roseboro is fully present with you. May we celebrate that when we feel a little lonely or sad. We acknowledge how human we are. Therefore, we need you to meet us where we are today in our grief and in our need. We acknowledge that we only know in part and that when it comes to things like this, we are best looking through a darkened mirror. We know only too well today the limits of our own power and wisdom. Still, we are looking to you for comfort and peace, for a beginning point in making the end what it truly is, a new beginning called eternal life. Be with us in this time together and begin to work your healing in our lives. We praise and love you, Lord Jesus, and in your name we pray. Amen.
another one of dad's favorites. <laughs> Thank you for that. May God bless you and keep you. May God grant light to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God be revealed to you in mercy and give you peace. Amen. Bless you, dear friends.